you're visiting us online, glad to have you with us. If you're visiting us in person, we're glad to have you here. As, a, as an opportunity, as we reflect tonight on all that Jesus did on that Good Friday, and it's, it's an interesting term, right? When we look at the, the pain and the suffering and the crucifixion of Jesus, and to call it a good day, <laughs> doesn't look like that at the surface, but the impact of that day is certainly good for our souls and for our, our eternity, and the fact that Jesus accomplished all that was necessary for us. Uh, in tonight's service, we're going to be reflecting on the seven words that Jesus spoke from the cross, or the seven times he spoke from the cross. Under the theme in our, in our journey through Lent, we've been looking at hands of the passion. And we're going, to, we're going to focus on the hands that were pierced for us, which are Jesus' hands. But as Jesus speaks words to those that are around him on the cross, we could rightly say that all of those individuals had a hand in piercing the hands of Jesus. And so we reflect not only on those around the base of the cross, but I pray it's an opportunity just for us to journey together tonight uh, with Jesus as he went to the cross on your behalf and on mine. We'll read from selected verses from Isaiah chapter 52 and 53. See, my servant will act wisely. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. The first set of hands that we want to look at are addressed in Jesus' first statement from the cross. Here's the the lesson from Luke chapter 23, verses 32 and 34. It says, Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Jesus speaks to those that were ignorant, that didn't know what they were doing. Now I thought about that and they said, well, these were professional executioners. It wasn't like Jesus was saying, no, you know what, you got the nail in the wrong place. You don't know exactly what you're doing. You know, this isn't quite painful enough. I think you can do better. He wasn't instructing them and saying, you know what, uh, Pilate, forgive them. They're kind of novices at this, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to survive this thing on the cross. He wasn't instructing them on how to do their job. They knew what they were doing. They knew exactly how to execute a Roman crucifixion. It wasn't like they needed any instruction from Jesus. But as Jesus looks down at those individuals, those soldiers that were simply carrying out their job for that day, and at the end of the day would go home to their families, as they put the criminal to his left and to his right and then did the same to him, they knew what they were doing. But they probably didn't know to whom they were doing it. Perhaps they had heard something about Jesus. Perhaps they had heard nothing about Jesus. Perhaps they were just following orders. And they had no authority to say, you know what, this guy's innocent. We're not putting him on the cross. They had to carry out the direction that Pilate had given the authority to do. Sometimes we say ignorance is bliss. Maybe it is easier to 
forgive someone who is ignorant? I don't know. Perhaps someone has done something that has wronged you and you realize, you know what, they, they didn't know what they were doing. But still inside, we find it hard to forgive. And like I said, it might be a little bit easier than someone who knows what they're doing and intentionally harms you. But yet ignorance still needs forgiveness. And the great thing about these words that Jesus spoke to the cross, to the hands of the ignorant that pounded the nails into his hands, you could rightly say that those soldiers were responsible for piercing the hands of Jesus, even though they didn't know what they were doing. Those hands that were nailed to the cross were still hands that were pierced for those ignorant of what they were doing. Which gives great comfort to us. Sometimes we know exactly that we're sinning against God. We need forgiveness. Sometimes we don't. And Jesus covers us with his forgiveness, even in our ignorance. The second time Jesus spoke, he spoke to those that weren't ignorant and weren't innocent. The two criminals, one on his left and one on his right, here's how Luke records it in chapter 23, verses 38 to 43. There was a written notice above Jesus which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Two criminals, one of the other gospels identifies them as thieves. It's interesting, if you remember the parable of the Good Samaritan, remember the individual who was attacked by robbers and beat him and left him for dead? This word identifies a criminal that doesn't, isn't like petty theft. This is like armed robbery. This is where you take something, but in the process you inflict bodily harm. So these criminals, as was the custom above Jesus, the placard was usually their offense. We don't know if that was above these two individuals or not, but they were robbers, they were thieves that had committed that type of crime, but also some sort of bodily harm. And some have even suggested that it was, was done in some sort of insurrection type way against the Roman government, which would make sense that then they would be crucified for their actions and their insurrection. But these were violent criminals. They knew full well what they were doing. And as the one suggests, we are getting what our deeds deserve. They couldn't make a plea from the cross and say, you know what, we don't deserve this. Jesus could have. Jesus could have made a stink of saying over and over and says, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. We have no record of Jesus stating his innocence other than that being proven by Pilate and saying, I find no fault in this man. Were those criminals around at the trial? Were they within earshot of finally Jesus going out or were they just aware that this man had done nothing wrong? Again, we don't know all the interaction that took place before, but the intersection of these three individuals was on three crosses outside of Jerusalem. Ironically, the crime above Jesus said, this is the king of the Jews. That's what Pilate had ordered. And perhaps the one criminal, if he was involved in insurrection, go, hey, here's another king. He claims to be the Christ. If he can get us down from the cross, you know what? We're, 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 we're brothers in the sense that we're, we're establishing a new kingdom. We want some change of authority. But his words were taunting. The other criminal rebukes him and says, we're guilty. We're getting what our deeds deserve. But Jesus was innocent. You can rightly say that both of those criminals had a part in nailing Jesus to the cross. 
They both had sinned, both against the government and against God, and as a result, fall short of the glory of God. The ending, as far as we can tell from the account that we're given in Scripture, is very different. For the very hands that were pierced in the middle cross were the ones that one of the criminals looks to and says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That certainly, by all indications, indicates a heart of faith that says, I'm not getting down from this cross, and we're going to die because that's what this sentence leads to. But the one who is accused of being the king of the Jews is the one that provides me hope for after this life ends. The Romans can punish my earthly sin, but this guy in the middle cross is paying for my eternal punishment. And if I'm going to find any hope on this afternoon on Golgotha, as I'm struggling to take each breath, God leads that criminal to find hope in the middle cross. He was getting what his deeds deserve. But the hands in the middle were going to give him what his deeds didn't deserve. His hands were going to fall lifeless on that cross later that day. But his soul was going to be received by the nail-pierced hands of the one on the middle cross. Whether ignorant or guilty, turning to the cross is the solution for sin. It's where our soul can find rest that the one who is pierced was pierced for you. The next time Jesus spoke, he addressed words to his mother and the disciple whom he loved, John. These words are recorded for us in John chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. It says, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. A son taking care of his mother, making sure that after he was done with his time on this earth, even though he came back and rose from the dead, he had 40 days and then he ascended into heaven, he wanted to make sure mom was taken care of. You would probably do the same thing. If you could, if you had opportunity as your dying days to make sure that those that you cared about most were taken care of. I can only imagine if I'm Mary or one of the other ladies or one of the disciples that are there, you have this crowd that is still taunting and jeering and you have the, the soldiers and perhaps a bit of a distance from the cross, you're just agonizing. Tears flowing from your eyes. Perhaps numb and just can't believe exactly what all is going on. Trying to sort it all out. Trying to comfort each other but not knowing what to say. We've probably been in situations like that. Maybe at a funeral of a loved one or someone passed away. you just like, your heart aches. Or you watch a loved one who's going through their final days in hospice care and you realize how much it hurts. Jesus looking down from the cross. If you've ever had the, the opportunity to interact with someone who's going in their final days and they know that life is short, it often is not about them. They're hurt that you're hurt. And they wish they could make your hurt go away. We don't know all of Jesus' thoughts, but I wonder if he was looking at the cross and saying, here's people who are hurting. He addresses the physical need of his mother. But you could rightly say the disciples and those women that were gathered, they had a hand in putting Jesus on the cross too. We don't have words of all of those followers of Jesus or the other ladies, but I'd like to focus on Jesus' mom, for whom it 
it probably pained the worst. At the beginning of Jesus' life, she sang a song. We call it the Magnificat. When she found out that she was going to have Jesus as a son by a gift of the Holy Spirit, I don't know this. But I wonder if some of the words that she spoke those 33 years earlier were flooding through her mind and perhaps had more significance at this moment than perhaps they did when she first spoke them. For when she first spoke them, she realized that the son that she was going to have was also going to be her savior. Mary was not perfect. She knew the name that they were going to give to this boy, Jesus, which means he saves, was for her too. I'd like to read those words, and we oftentimes put them at Christmas. But let's put them at the foot of the cross and see if they ring true there as well. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. I, I don't picture that Mary's having an outward show of rejoicing. But remember, at Jesus' birth, she would ponder these things in her heart. I wonder if she looked back and said, you know what? What happened on that Friday afternoon ends up giving me the greatest joy because there I saw my son carrying out the purpose for which God gave him to me. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. Perhaps just hearing the mercy of her son, Father, forgive them. Today you'll be with me in paradise. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. The epitome of mercy was her son on the cross for Mary, for Israel, for the whole world. And Mary knew that the mission of her son included dying for her sins, too. A few days after Jesus' birth, they went to the temple and there was a faithful believer named Simeon. If you've been part of our worst traditional worship services, we, we sing this song after receiving the Lord's Supper. And Simeon saw the salvation of God in the child Jesus, and God had told him in some way, you're not gonna die until you see this salvation. And once he saw Jesus, he knew that God has fulfilled his promises. I don't think Simeon was at the foot of the cross. He was pretty old when Jesus was just a little boy. But he said something to Mary. This son who gives you great joy today, one day a sword will pierce your own soul. Today was the day. As a mother to watch your son. Simeon said, the son that is gonna bring great joy to you and all people. It's gonna hurt. He said this, sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what he said, was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Were the thoughts of many revealed on Good Friday? Absolutely. You could probably pretty well see those that were for him and those that were against him. Those that seemed to profess an allegiance to the Lord but now had turned to crucify their Lord. Simeon was right. And Jesus knew 
that the sword was piercing his mother's soul. And from the cross, he wants to make sure that there's one who can take care of her. And so he turns to one of his closest followers and friends and says, John, take care of mom. And mom, John's gonna take care of you. Jesus was there for his mother Mary to pay for her sins. But he was also there to care for his mom. The next time Jesus speaks, he's, I don't know if, if, if pinnacle is the right term, but at the greatest moment of, of suffering, where we, we see, yes, the, the beatings, the crucifixion. But in the darkness that fell over the land, Jesus cries out to one who wasn't there, his father. He says this, Matthew 27, 45 to 49. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. They thought he was crying out to Elijah. He was crying out to his God, his father. Again, the mystery of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit interacting together. Jesus in his humanity gives up the full use of his divine powers, yet remains God, yet is separated from God. We won't try and sort it out theologically tonight, but there was one person that could have stopped this all. It wasn't Pilate. It wasn't Herod. It wasn't the chief priests. It was the one to whom Jesus directed his prayers in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he said, Father, if there's another way, let this cup of suffering pass. His father could have said, yeah, let's stop. Jesus yielded and said, not my will, but yours be done. The fact that the suffering continued in his path to the cross ensued was his father's answer. There's no other way. There's no other way for this to happen. There's no other way for the punishment of sin to be taken care of. You could rightly say that God nailed his son to the cross. Why do I say that? Isaiah chapter 53, we spoke it earlier, but again it says this, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And the Lord, though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. This was part of God's plan. At this moment on the cross, Jesus is suffering separation from God, which is really the essence of hell. Hell is an eternity separated from the presence of God. Jesus doesn't want us to, to suffer the same separation from God. Yet he was willing to step into our place and suffer that reality in the darkness that settled over the Jerusalem area, over the world. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm not blaming God for putting his son on the cross. There are many hands in this room and around the world that we can rightly place the blame on, which We'll get there. But God could have said, no, we're not going to do this. We're going to let people fend for themselves. But the fact that what Isaiah prophesied 700 years earlier came to fulfillment on that first Good Friday 
we see God acting on his plan because he loved you. And he was willing to put the nails in the hands of his son so that he would not have to put them in yours. He was willing to abandon his son so that you and I would never have to be separated from him. It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer because he was bearing the sin of you and me. The next time Jesus speaks, it's a very short request. He says this in John chapter 19, 28 to 19, or 28 to 29. Later, knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. We don't know who this soldier was. Perhaps one of the same ones Jesus addressed earlier. Ignorant of what he was doing, in regard to crucifying the Son of God, but knew his role. I'm sure it wasn't the first time there was a jar of wine vinegar by a crucifixion. There's a way to numb the pain for those being crucified, a little show of mercy amidst the torture of death. When Jesus asked for a drink, it wasn't just the fact that he had lost a lot of blood. It wasn't just the fact that his mouth was dry and parched. It wasn't even necessarily that he was trying to numb the pain. But John gives us an insight, and this is the amazing reality of God's infinite plan as it plays out down to the very detail so that the scriptures might be fulfilled Jesus said, I am thirsty. A scripture that was written hundreds of years earlier in Psalm 69, verse 21, it says, for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. The one who identified himself as the water of life needing a, a drink. <laughs> If I were in this type of condition, remembering details probably wouldn't be the first thing on my mind. Jesus had two things to say yet. He wanted to fulfill scripture and so he asked for a drink. The, the helper that was there, was it happenstance? It's like, oh, here's a jar of wine vinegar. Let's give it to the criminal. You might say that was coincidence. I say this is God's design to show how intricately he was aware and he planned and he orchestrated every detail for your salvation and mine. And Jesus asked for a drink, not to numb the pain, but to fulfill scripture and to say two more things that he wanted the world to hear. Jesus, in John chapter 19, verse 30, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. You say, well, why did Jesus want to drink to say this uh, one word in, the, in the, the Greek language, three in our English language, it is finished. Maybe some of you read the devotion this morning that I emailed out. And what, what came to mind in reflecting on this phrase, yes, I do listen to Dave Ramsey once in a while, and part of his show is the debt-free scream. And when couples or individuals come on his show and they give a debt-free scream, there's a lot of emotion behind it because there is a lot of debt that they worked hard to pay off, thousands of dollars, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars, six months, six years, 
And as they're giving the opportunity, they realize there is no more debt. They owe nothing to anyone. And as you hear them scream, I'm debt free, you can realize that there's freedom in being debt free. This word that Jesus uses is a word that was put on stamps or written on a bill of sale once the entire bill had been paid for. It was one that shopkeepers would use when the debt had been paid in full. And the fact that Jesus speaks it from the cross, it's not a financial debt, but it's a debt that has been accumulating and would accumulate from the hundreds of thousands of millions of billions of people that would sin each and every day that God laid on him the iniquity of all, the sin of all, the debt of all. I can't even imagine bearing the debt that even I owe to my Father in heaven. For each sin is demanded repayment with a life, and I don't have enough lives to give. My Father says, be perfect, and I know I fall way short of perfection. And so I have this burden that I can't call up a talk radio show and go, what are the seven baby steps to get rid of this debt and this guilt? I wish there were. We maybe make them up in our, own, in our own minds and say, well, if I do these good things, then God should be pleased with me. If I do a little bit better than 50% of the population, I'll sure be on the good side of, of God at the end of my life. I'm guessing there are people that are worse off than me, and if God looks at the debt I owe, it's probably far less than others. That doesn't matter. There, there, there's not baby steps to getting right with God. There's only one step, and that's to the foot of the cross. And there we receive the gift of this payment in full. Where Jesus was willing to take your sin and mine and take it to the cross. And as he declared from the cross, it is finished. He says it to you. You're debt free. At this point in our worship, you have, we were given a nail as you came in and a, and a red ribbon around it to to signify our sin. And what I would invite us to do, there are holes that are drilled in this cross. And we've been reflecting on the words of Jesus. And, and as you come up, I want you to hear him say to you, put your name in your thoughts. Mine would be, Mike, it's finished. Your debt is paid for. And whether you verbalize it, scream it, or just silently reflect on it, I want you and your reaction to be, I'm debt free. I don't have any debts before my heavenly father because they've been completely paid for on the cross. Jesus tells you it's paid in full. And where there is freedom from debt, there is freedom to live debt-free. Jesus speaks one last time. He experienced separation from his father. And now we're not looking at hands that pierced him, but hands that were ready and willing to receive him. The scripture from Luke chapter 23, verses 44 to 46. It was about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. If what Jesus had done was not enough, there would be no confidence to say, Father, receive my soul. His body was going to be placed in the tomb. But the fact that his father was willing to receive his spirit tells us that what Jesus did was enough. It was complete. It was 
finished. The father that had separated from him and he experienced that separation for those hours of darkness, having gained a drink, declaring it's finished, and father, into your hands I commit my spirit. There was no question for all those that were around. The soldiers, you remember the centurion, one of them said, surely this was the son of God. By the end of that day on that mountain outside of Jerusalem, the work that God had sent Jesus to do was complete. His family and friends. Yes, there were, there were unanswered questions, the silence of Saturday. We have the benefit of looking back and realizing that the story didn't end when his body was placed in the ground. The spirit that his father received reunited with the body and in a glorified way showed himself alive. We'll get to celebrate that in just a couple days. But as we've seen hands that pierce Jesus, the ignorant, the criminals, family and friends, God himself, those standing by, those helping, you and me. I pray that tonight we've had an opportunity to once again realize that what Jesus went through wasn't by accident, but by God's design with you in mind. So that one day when we take our final breath, we don't have to question where we're headed. And as perhaps family and friends have tears as they mourn our end on this earth, our final breath can be spent with these same words. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And we can live in peace. We can die in peace. Because the hands that were pierced were pierced for you. Amen. Lord Jesus, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And as you head out tonight, may Jesus, who is the light of the world, shine brightly in your hearts and lives with the full assurance that the hands that were pierced on the cross were certainly ones that were pierced for you.